Last Sunday I spoke to you about us walking in healing as a Christian. What an important topic this is. It's critical for us to understand how the things in our life mesh together. The way they impact us as they do. This morning we're going to take a look at John's third epistle. An epistle is a letter. Of course, it comes up as three John. It is a book just before the book of Jude, which is before the book of Revelation. But in this letter, John writes to a person named Gaius. And the beloved disciple in this passage gives us God's heart for us as his children. And sometimes in my daily readings that I share with you, I mention names from whom I am quoting. So if I quote somebody, I tell you who it is I'm quoting from. Names such as Clark and Valworth and Matthew Henry and John Wesley. And sometimes you might come across and think, who, who the heck is Clark? It's not Clark Kent and it's not Clark in the church. These are men of old who have made commentary on Bible passages. And they can give some additional light to our understanding. Now me quoting one of their pearls of wisdom does not necessarily mean that I agree with all of their doctrine and all of their everything. What it says is this that they are saying adds some flavor to that which we are learning about, that which we are reading. For example, if I was to quote a, something from a staunch Calvinist, it doesn't necessarily mean that I believe in every aspect that they believe in as far as they believe in predestination. I am quoting something that is of value. But there are other Bible scholars that have got different views on different things, and that's okay. It doesn't mean we throw out everything just because we don't believe in maybe one aspect or whatever it is. Now, Clark has something interesting to say about these little books of the Bible. Like these three epistles of John. I'm talking about 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And this is what he says. But it has been the lot both of the minor prophets and the minor epistles to be generally neglected. For with many readers, bulk is everything, and no magnitude, no goodness. So here he's saying that these little books of the Bible are also important. But many people will only take the big books of the Bible and put value to them. He's saying we need to put value to these little books as well. And in this little book, this letter or this epistle of 3 John, he is writing to a good friend called Gaius. Probably the same man that he appointed as bishop over the church of Pergamum. Because what you've got to understand is Gaius was quite a popular name in those days. So just because he comes up the name Gaius here doesn't mean it's the same Gaius that you read of in other passages in the Bible. The name Gaius comes up a number of times in Scripture. There was Gaius of Macedonia, who was a traveling companion to the Apostle Paul. And in Acts 19, you read of that riot. Remember the silversmiths? They were making those little things for their goddess Diana. And there was a whole riot, an uproar surrounding that. Because Paul cast out a demon spirit, and it impacted their business, so they caused a riot. Gaius was one that was taken prisoner in this riot. There is one of the, the Gaiuses. In Acts 20, we read of Gaius of Derby, which was a province of Galatia. That is another Gaius. And here in John's third epistle, we find this Gaius, who is a member of an unnamed church. He doesn't mention the, the church's name. But he was a man known for hospitality towards the traveling preachers. Because in those days, preachers would travel from town to town, and they would need to be set up somewhere. They would need somewhere to sleep. They would need to eat. 
Gaius was very good at that. That was his ministry that God had given him. Two of the Gaiuses referred to in Scripture, actually, were very good at hospitality. And probably this is why John Bunyan, when he wrote, remember, Pilgrim's Progress, he had an innkeeper in that book named Gaius, probably referring to these other Gaiuses that were so good in their hospitality, displaying those characteristics. The name Gaius means happy or one who rejoices. And both these Gaiuses in the Bible display those characteristics. And with this in mind, let's turn to John's first epistle. Sorry, John's third epistle, from which I want to glean just a little bit of truth, just from the opening comments. We're not going to go through the whole epistle today. Just the opening comments. So, reading from 3 John, verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. There's a few things we're going to pull out there. But the main thing, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. It is God's plan for you to be well. And this wellness is all embracing. You as a complete person are impacted by this wellness. He wants you to be well spiritually. He wants you to be well mentally. He wants you to be well emotionally. He wants you to be well physically. And in this opening, the Apostle John was excited for their spiritual well-being. He says that the greatest thing to him, his children, he's talking to the church. This is one of the churches that he oversaw. He saw the church as his children, that they were walking in the truth. That was the greatest joy for him. His love for them was clear. And he was most concerned about their spiritual well-being, as I am for you as a congregation. His desire was them, for them to flourish in their physical health in the same degree as they were fl flourishing in their spiritual health. Now let's pause here. You know in the Psalms, sila, you know, that's stop. Take a moment to consider what has been said. That's what sila means. Ponder what you've just heard. Let me put my thinking from this passage into, into words for you. Let me ask you a question. How healthy would you be if your physical health matched your, phys your spiritual health? Think about it. He prays that they would prosper in their health as they are prospering in their spiritual state. How well would you be in your physical state if it matched your spiritual state? Because that's what he's saying in this passage. That's what he wants for them. He says, you're flourishing in your spiritual state, and I want you to flourish equally in your physical state. What does your spiritual health look like right now? Do you want your physical state to match your spiritual state? Or is it missing a mile? Some people would be on their deathbeds if their physical state matched their spiritual state. But God's desire is for us to be strong and healthy and vibrant, let me add. Vibrant, not just making it, but vibrant in all spheres of our being. Spiritually, and I put spiritually first on, in, on purpose. Mentally, emotionally, and physically. I purposely placed physical health last. As you cannot be properly healthy in your body if you are ailing in the other areas of your life. Your physical health is a result 
of your whole being health. If you are spiritually, mentally, or emotionally unwell, it's going to affect your health as well. You are a complete person as God's child. Not just a spiritual aspect of you. God is interested in all of you. Every aspect of you. All your flaws and all your strengths. All your victories and all your failures. All that you are proud of. And all the things you hang your head in shame of, God embraces you and loves you and wants to fill you with His presence until all the areas of darkness flee before His marvelous light. God is embracing you as a complete person. Last Sunday I was speaking of the importance that forgiveness plays in the healing of your inner wounds. I was saying that the demons live within those wounds. That's where we fall down. Those wounds which enable the enemy to control you with. Those areas that he wants, he wants to keep right at the surface of your life. Where you can feel their pain. And through that pain he controls and manipulates you. As a child of God, would you be proud to have the devil able to control and manipulate you? I think we would all agree that we wouldn't be proud. But if you were to search your life, you could probably find areas where he has been in control, where he has manipulated you. Probably we've all given him some power to do so at some point. He sees you wanting to start praying again in the morning like you used to. And he says, we'll have none of that. You recognize to the need to forgive your mom or your partner or whoever. And the devil says, we can't allow that to happen. He sees you wanting to get up in the morning to come to church. And he says, I corner. Just think of the tough week you have had. You've had to get up early every morning to go to work. You deserve this break. Just pull the covers up a little higher and rest your weary eyes for a moment. You've earned it. You know that gentle, smooth voice he uses when he's not screaming at you, singing you into a lullaby of sleep. You've earned what? The privilege of missing out on all that God has for you on the Lord's day. Missing out on worshipping the Almighty God along with the body of Christ. The chance to be impacted by the Holy Spirit and filled with the joy of the Lord. Never think that Satan has your best interests at heart. When you start listening to that voice, you must know he's got an alternate plan for you. God has a plan for your life. You know that. Well, Satan has one too. Guess which plan gets to be played out. The one you allow. Both have plans. Diametrically opposed to one another. They don't run parallel. They are diametrically opposed to one another. Whose plan is panning out in your life? Satan hates God and all who belong to him. He wants to destroy your life and drag you down to hell with him. You've got to know that, folks. That's his agenda. He takes a sewage spill of gunk bubbling up out of a block drain. And he tries to paint it into such a pretty picture for you. And he knows which words to use for you personally. Those words that trigger, that draw you in. Devious words of deceit. Coming across as truth, like a Jedi Knight using his mind control tricks. How gullible we have been. But no longer, because God is speaking to us, and we are listening, and he is bringing us into his light. The darkness is fleeing. And God's primary concern is that you spend eternity with him. You must know that. Your comfort is not God's primary concern. Often as people, we put comfort above our spiritual state. 
Staying in bed on a Sunday is easier than getting up and coming to church. Your comfort is at a higher level than your spiritual state. You've got more value in just chilling out than actually doing something that's going to build you spiritually. God's primary concern is your spiritual state for you to get into eternity with him. He doesn't want you going to hell. It's awesome. And I trust it's, we are similar. That's, that's our primary concern too. The alternative, of course, is spending eternity in hell in eternal torment. None of us want that. You think this life can be tough. Ha! It's got nothing to do on the lake of fire that is ahead. Your three score and ten here on earth isn't something just to get finished as quickly as possible or something to do with as much comfort as possible just so that you can squeeze into heaven. God wants more for you in this life and that more is found only in Him. His love for you has no bounds embracing you in the fullness and at the same time in the emptiness of who you are. He birthed you as a unique creation, just the way you are. And he wanted you in a unique relationship with him. Nobody on earth can have the same relationship with God that you have. Nobody. It's unique. Because their relationship is different to yours. You and your God in intimate partnership with one another. That's his desire for you. Not for us just getting into heaven by the skin of our teeth. You are of value to God. Both this side of the grave and the other side. And your spiritual well-being is extremely important to Him as everything else flows out of that platform of your spiritual health. Proverbs 4 tells us, My son, and I will add, My daughter, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. Listen to me. God says, I know what you need. That's what God is saying. Incline your ear and listen intently, he says. Keep my words before you. Yes, keep them in the very center of your heart, for they are life to those who find them. Many people searching for the meaning of life, and it's not 42. Searching, 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 but never finding. Trying Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, but never finding the truth. Why not? Because the truth is hidden in God's word. It's not hidden in Buddha. It's not hidden in Shiva. It's not hidden in Zoroaster. It's not hidden in Gandhi or Confucius or in any wisdom of man or human exalted deity. It is found in Jesus and in his word. And in God's word, we find life. You want life? True life? I have come, Jesus says that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus, the Word of God, He is the life bringer. And the deceiver, Satan, wants you to believe that life and joy and all the good things are found in living the life that He has for you. Like He did with Adam and Eve. Shine up that piece of fruit until their mouths are drooling. Before they took that bite, he had them drooling. He had them hanging on every word. They couldn't wait to take a bite, which was in direct opposition to God's instruction for them. The same in your life. He wants to paint a garbage pile with pretty colors and get you to wallow in it, thinking that that is life. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Satan is the deceiver. Why would we trust 
the deceiver over our Abba Father. Satan wants to steal true life from you. He has a singular destructive vision for you. The thief does not come except, see the word except. What is the except? One thing described in three clear descriptions. To steal and to kill and to destroy. This is Satan's plan for you for the duration of your life. And then he wants to drag you into the lake of fire with him. That's, that's his plan. But we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are not supposed to fall under Satan's jurisdiction and authority. We've been bought with a price. We are not our own. Never mind the devil's own. We're not even our own. We are owned by Jesus. Paid for with his blood. You have the authority of the name of Jesus. Stop bending your ear to the deceiver's voice and listening to his lies. God's plan for you is hugely different to the plan of destruction for the enemy. For he has come that you may have life, that you may have it more abundantly. If you want it, it is yours. Abundant life in Jesus Christ. And it begins with spiritual healing. The Spirit of God coming down, coming into you and doing a work, an inner work of healing. The Spirit of God being given access by the gatekeeper of your heart, you. Being granted permission to come in and to take up residency and authority. You climbing off the throne of your heart and saying, Jesus, you climb on the throne. You be Lord and master of my life. That is the difference, really, between a born again and a non-born again. Yes, it is the filling of the Holy Spirit. But it starts with a person climbing off the throne and allowing Jesus onto the throne. You unlocking all the closed doors so that he can come in and do what he does best, lead you in your life. How come there are locked doors? Because of things like unbelief. You want God to come in and heal you, but the door is locked, preventing him from coming in. You are standing with the keys in your hand while you stand sobbing like Hannah in the temple. For God to come in and help you. And all the time the keys are in your hand. Jesus is knocking. But the door is locked. And you stand there sobbing saying, come in. Why won't Jesus come in? And you've got the locked door. You just need to put the key in the lock by choosing to forgive those who hurt you. And you turn the key by speaking out that forgiveness. I forgive them, Lord. Come heal me of the pain which they caused. I release them of the debt that I've been holding against them. As you have released me from my debt. I don't feel like doing it. Because my emotions are trying to hold me captive. But I refuse to be held captive. I choose your word over my feelings. And I set them free. Can you see the choice that you have? It is a choice. And the enemy the whole time wants to remind you of the pain. He wants to remind you of how they've hurt you. Remind you of how they've betrayed you, whatever it is. And as long as you are thinking about those things, the hurt and the betrayal, you never forgive. You are allowing feelings to dominate. Feelings, emotions are one of the the channels through which Satan works. He is able to manipulate you through your feelings if you allow him. No more. We will not allow him. We are not primarily emotional beings. We are primarily spiritual beings. And I'm going to speak more about that in some weeks to come. I refuse to be held captive. And I choose God's word over my 
feelings. Jesus is on the throne of my heart, not me. I set them free. And as the realization starts to dawn on you, that you were partnering with the enemy in this, you have permitted him to keep you prisoner. That's what's happened. You realize the magnitude of that deception and you start to weep inside in the knowledge that as a son or daughter of the Most High God, you have allowed the enemy to control you in an area that Jesus has already paid the price for. How foolish I've been over all of these years, you think. You wanted to heal me, but I stubbornly refused to come to that place of healing. The eyes of my understanding have been opened. And the light of the Lord has flooded in. Casting out the deception, the darkness of the deception in which I resided. I've been set free through my obedience to God's word. By truly partnering with God, I've placed myself in a position of healing. Spiritual healing between me and my God. I have been set free. And from this place of spiritual healing, my emotions are forced to come in line. Because I've taken spiritual authority over my life, forcing my emotions to a position of submission in my life. Taken spiritual authority to my submission to God and His Word. And now my life starts to align with God's plan for me as a whole. I want you to think of Elijah. Remember Elijah declared a drought. Three and a half years. And in that drought time, he was impacted. And he had no food. And he had no water. And God said to Elijah, go to this place, this brook here, there's water. I'm going to send my ravens to feed you. Now what if we had been Elijah? How submissive would we have been to God's word? Would we have said, okay, Lord, I'm on my way. Like when God told Abraham, go to a place I will show you, the next day he'd packed up and gone. He didn't wait to say, well, give me more info, Lord. I want to know more. Will I need a visa? Will I need my passport? He packed his things and he started walking to a place I will show you. Well, here God showed Elijah exactly where he needed to be. The ravens would have brought the meat to that place whether Elijah was there or not. The only difference is, if he wasn't there, he wouldn't have been able to receive it. Are you in that place of healing where God is calling you to? Or are you like Jonah, opposite direction? In the bottom of the boat, hiding away, sailing in the opposite direction. God was still with Jonah. No matter where Jonah ran, God was with him. You can't escape God. He is a faithful God. Our job is to walk in submission to Him, to say, okay, Lord, I have run enough. I have ducked and dived enough. I recognize the deception that I've been living in. I have listened to the voice of the enemy. I have fixated upon the hurt that they have caused me and stubbornly refused to forgive them because I'm hurting. And God says, I know you're hurting. I am your healer. I want to come in and heal. Let me in. Knock, knock, knock. Let me in. Knock, knock, knock. Let me in. God, why aren't you coming in? I choose to forgive them, Lord. I lay it down. I set them free. I release them. I set them free. Because you've got more for me than being held in this place by the enemy. This place of pain. This place of spiritual dormancy. I have, God has got more for you. 
cast it off. Look up and say, Lord, whatever, whatever it takes, that I will do. Because when we come to Jesus, it's got to be all out. We don't add Jesus to a list of other gods. In some religions, they have multiple gods. Some of them many thousands. You can't add Jesus as I'm just another deity. When you choose Jesus, it is Jesus. Everything else is done away with. I turned to hear the voice that was speaking to me. Book of Revelation, John. I turn to hear. You need to turn away from everything else. Turn away from your stubbornness not to forgive. Turn away from the feelings of, of pain and hurt and anguish and all torment and anxiety and worry. Let's turn away and let us hear the voice of Jesus speaking to me personally, each one of you, me personally. And say, come, I've got more for you. I've got more. You can choose to stay as you are for the rest of your life. Or you can turn to Jesus. Jesus, the healer. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically. But it starts spiritually. God isn't in the business of healing somebody physically so that they can carry on their life of sin the way they were living. God wants to primarily heal us spiritually. And out of that will come soundness of mind, balance of emotions, healing in the body. Am I saying that every single person that receives Jesus is instantly healed of all ailments? No, I am not. There is a walk. And as the Apostle Paul learned, sometimes God even leaves something in our life. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Maybe the Apostle Paul, with all the power that God gave him, would have got arrogant in himself. Thinking, wow, I am really something. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe God allowed a thorn in the flesh to keep him on his knees. To keep him looking up. To keep him aware that without Jesus, I am lost. I am desperate for you. So we are on this journey. And we've been speaking about Forgiveness, because forgiveness is a massive aspect of your well-being. It is a massive aspect of your spiritual well-being and every other well-being in your body. We've got to sort out that first. And last week, I led you in a prayer, and I'm going to do it again. Because maybe there's some different people here today, or maybe last week you were stubborn. And he said, no, Lord, I won't. So I'm going to do a similar prayer. Maybe last week you chose to forgive somebody. And then on Monday, you remembered how they hurt you. And you think, well, maybe I didn't forgive them. You know, when I married my wife, I made a choice to love her. And this October, we've been married 35 years. And over 35 years, for those of you who've been married a while, know that there can be times when it's not as rosy as other times. But the choice to love is a choice. It's not a feeling. Because if we're only going to love when we feel, what happens on those days when you don't feel like loving? Love is a choice. So maybe there's some days that you wake up and you feel unloved. Or you feel that you don't have the capacity to love. Remind yourself of your choice. It's the same with forgiveness. You might wake up and you might be feeling low that day. And you might be experiencing all the emotions of the unforgiveness. And yet you have forgiven. It's because you're human. 
You need to learn to rise up, to take control of those emotions and say, I have forgiven. It doesn't matter how I feel, it was a choice. I have spoken it out and I believe spiritually it's important when we do certain things like forgiveness that we speak it out. That the words come over our lips. It's not just a thought. You need to know on that day I spoke those words. I chose to forgive and I stand by my choice no matter how I'm feeling right now. If we want to move forward spiritually, we have to conquer this, number one, this home base. And I realize some of you have been hurt worse than what I've been hurt. I know a little bit of some of your stories. And I'm not downplaying. I'm not saying it's not a hectic, destructive thing in your life. I am saying, if you don't want it to be a constant destructive for the rest of your life, deal with it. Come to that point to say, Lord, I let them go. I really don't feel like it. But you tell me to do it. I will do it out of obedience. And when you start getting obedient to God's word, that is your sign of submission to him. When we are doing what we want to do, you must know Jesus is not on the throne. For Jesus to be Lord and Master, that means you are saying, yes, sir. When he says forgive, yes, sir. When he says walk away, yes, sir. He is Master. Allow Jesus to take up permanent residence on the throne of your life. And learn the art of submission to God. And it will stand you in good stead for the rest of your life. And you can thank me one day in eternity for encouraging you in this direction. So, Heavenly Father, once again, can I ask everyone to stand? If you are able to stand, please do so. If you're not able to stand, God's healing power upon you right now in Jesus' name. Lord, again we stand before you. And all of us have experienced pain, Hurt, betrayal, whatever it is, Lord. But we refuse to be held in bondage any longer. We refuse for the deception of the enemy to be ruling over you when ruling over us when your word should be ruling over us. So we purposefully switch on the light switch of the light of God. The light floods in, the darkness flees. Those words of deception flee in Jesus' name. And we stand, Lord, spiritually naked as it were before you, saying, Lord, I have sinned in this area. I have held on to unforgiveness. I have refused to forgive. And you know all the reasons, Lord. You know all the pain and everything else. But, Lord, we don't want to major on what we have experienced. We want to major on what you say. You call us to forgiveness and we are responding, Lord. And either we are responding for the first time today or we are saying, Lord, I have responded to this last week and I thank you, Lord. I am cementing my decision. I am ratifying that, that decision. And we stand before you, Lord. All the people, before us, that have hurt us. And for some here, it might be many. For some, it might be only one that has seriously hurt. But we let them go. We speak out the words, I forgive you, whoever it is. I forgive you. I'll set you free. And I walk away. All attachments, Lord, all those spiritual attachments of pain, and demonic attach attachments of anxiety and worry. I cut them off in the spirit realm. I cut them off, Lord. We will have no attachments that the enemy can manipulate us through. I cut them off and I look to you. And I say, thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven me. As you have forgiven me, so I forgive others. 
I forgive them in entirety. There are no T's and C's apply. There are no strings attached. I forgive them. And I look to you, Lord. And I ask for your healing balm to flow. To flow through to each person who is taking this seriously. And for your healing balm to heal the wounds. To heal the hurts. Lord, we are on a mission with you. We are clinging to you. We love you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Even during the times when we haven't been faithful, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for your healing right now. We receive it. We bask in it. We glory in you and in your presence. And I pray, Lord, a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit for each one of us. A fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit. Fill me, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. That I may have the power to live this life in a way that brings glory to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've got one song for us to sing. In closing. Yes, Lord, you are a good, good Father. And you are calling us into a deeper level of love with you. And we are those who are responding. We are saying, yes, Lord, we want to go deeper. We want to draw nearer to you and get deeper in this relationship and receive more healing. Lord, our hearts, our minds are open to that which you are saying. Would you lead us on this path, Lord, each one individually? Would you lead us and just cause miraculous change in every one of our lives, Lord? Give each one of us a testimony of your goodness, your power. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Remind you, for those who, who are considering membership or just want to learn more about the church, please stay behind straight after service. Just come to the center in the middle here and I'll speak to you. But for the rest, the Lord, well, for all of us, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed.